Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we are in Romans chapter 9. We resume our study in verse 18 today. Romans chapter 9, verse 18. Grab your Bible, open it up if you can do that, and uh, we'll get started shortly. I will just take a minute to tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Do check it out. If you love the Word of God, that's a place to go and study it from Genesis through Revelation, verse by verse, three times, all the way through at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And all you got to do is click on the book you want to study, the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it. A comprehensive Bible college education right there at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Romans chapter 9. Let's begin our reading in verse 16. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God who showeth mercy. Salvation doesn't come from working for it. It comes from God deciding that he is going to show mercy to a particular person. Verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. I talked about this last time, but I think it's really important, so I'm going to talk about it again. God put a horrible sinner on the throne of Egypt, and his name was Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I don't know what his name was. I don't think anybody does. But you know who I'm talking about, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And uh, God put him on that man on the throne, to show the world what happens to a person who rebels against him and then refuses to repent. And I just want to be clear about one thing. If that king, whatever his name was, would have done something else for a living, he would have been just as corrupt, just as sinful in whatever else he did. He just happened to be king which put him in the public eye. But I also want you to know that God did not, did not force that man, the king of Egypt, to be corrupt just so he could make an example of him. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, was what he was in his heart. That's just who he was of his own free will. He just happened to be king. He could have been a clerk at a store. And he probably would have taken money from the owner. Or he would have been rude to the customers. He could have been a ditch digger. And he would have been a miserable, ungodly, corrupt digger of ditches. And you couldn't turn your back on him. Or he'd steal something out of your lunch pail. Or he hit you over the back of the head with his shovel or something. He's just corrupt. He was just bad. But God raised him up, put him on the throne of Egypt. And Pharaoh acted the way that he wanted to act. Nobody forced him to. God simply decided not to let all of his wickedness go to waste. So he used them to prove a point. And the point was this. God hates sin. And sinners always lose, no matter how powerful they may be. Verse 18. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardens. Always remember this. If that, if that bothers you, then maybe you need to get back to square one and remember something very basic and fundamental. This is God's world. And he can do whatever he wants to do. This is God's world. 
and God can save any worthless, miserable, undeserving sinner that he wants to save. God is not being unfair to an unworthy sinner who he doesn't save simply because he chooses to save some other ungodly sinner. Neither one of them deserve to be saved. Both deserved to burn in hell. God's not being unfair to George by showing mercy to Sam. No one who burns in hell is there unfairly. And no one who is saved deserves to be saved. We're so used to we're so used to cause and effect. We're so used to life that is governed by effort that we apply that principle to salvation, and we should not. It does not apply. Verse 19. Thou wilt say then, send, say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath yet resisted his will? Well, no one can resist God's will. Not once he sets his mind on doing something. Like, for example, hardening a sinner's heart, like he did with Pharaoh. No one can resist his will once he does that. Once God does that, it's hard. That heart is hard, and it won't get soft again. Of course, you always got to remember this, and this is very important. God wouldn't heart and harden anyone's heart if they didn't harden their heart themselves first, which is why they alone are still to blame for their damnation. They made the wrong choice to begin with. And God just gave them what, what they wanted. He just turned them over to the hardness of their heart that they, that they wanted, that they chose. Verse 20. But nay, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? God doesn't have to explain his actions to anyone. If man doesn't like something that God does, the problem lies with man's understanding, not in God's actions. God does whatever he wants to do. And whatever he does is the definition of right. So man should just be quiet and not presume to judge God. Verse 20 and 21. Let's read 19. Thou, thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? But nay, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? This is God's world right here. This is God's world so he can do whatever he wants to do with it or with us. That's a starting point for whatever our thoughts might be. That's, that should be the starting point for all of our reasoning. This is God's world. He owns the world and everything on it, the Bible says, including us. So he can do whatever he wants to do with us or with the world. And it's like the illustration he uses right here. A potter has the right to make anything he wants to out of that clay that he's working with. It's his choice. It's his clay. It's his skill. It's his time. It's his energy. He can make whatever he wants to make. He has the right to make an ugly container and use it as a garbage can if he wants to. He has the right to turn that clay into a beautiful pot. Just like an artist. An artist has the right to paint an awful picture and hang it in his living room if he wants to do that. And Almighty God has the right to take a no-account sinner and use him to display his righteous wrath if he wants to do that. 
The guy's already a no-account, ungodly, miserable, wretched sinner. If God wants to use him to make a point and to display his wrath, God has every right in the world to do that. And no one has a right to question that. Verse 22, what if God, choosing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? And this was, this was exactly the case with Pharaoh right here. God had every right to kill that man long before he became the king of Egypt because he was a sinner from the day that he was born. And God certainly has a right, had a right to kill him the second that he said, no, I'm not going to set the people free when Moses first went and demanded it in the name of the Lord. God had every right to kill him and send him to hell right then and there. And when you understand just how hideous sin is to God, how much he hates it and how it irritates him and how it is just thoroughly disgusting to him, you'll see that putting up with Pharaoh's sin was not something that God enjoyed doing. But if God wants to put up with someone's sin and display his hatred for it by punishing them on earth rather than ridding the world of that person by sending them to hell right away, well, then he can do that if he wants to. He could cut them off, send them to hell right away, and, and never give them another thought if he wanted to. So he has the right to keep them around and show his holy hatred for sin by punishing the guy. 23. That he might make known the rich... Well, let's read 22 along with it. What if God, choosing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy whom he hath prepared before unto glory one way god displays his power to his people is by punishing the wicked and that certainly was the case with pharaoh too you know one of the reasons that god put pharaoh through the ringer like he did Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his heart, hardened his heart several times. Then finally God said, I'm going to harden your heart. And that was it. But he kept sending plagues because of Pharaoh's stubborn refusal to repent. And you know what that did? Systematically, God knocked off of every one of Egypt's, Egypt's gods, which is what those judgment were, judgments were um, aimed at. Each one of them knocked down one of Egypt's gods. So by the time... God was through turning Egypt into a basket case and destroying all the gods of Egypt and destroying Pharaoh and his army in the process. The people of Israel who had been down in Egypt for a long time, and some of them may have been drawn into that idol worship of the Egyptians. By the time God got through, there was no doubt Israel's God was God. So he used Pharaoh's stubbornness and refusal to repent to display his power to his people. It wasn't just a display of power to sinners like Pharaoh. It was a display of power to God's own people so that they wouldn't doubt our God is God. So one way God displays his power to his people is by punishing the wicked. And when God showed his power over sinners and his hatred for sin, he increased the faith of his people Israel down in Egypt. By the time God finished blasting Pharaoh in Egypt, Israel's faith in him was sky high. 24. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not my beloved. The church is made up of people who at one time did not belong to God because they didn't care about him. True of you? True of me? I'm part of the church of Jesus Christ, but there was a time in my life I didn't belong to Jesus Christ because I didn't care about Jesus. And that's true of every sinner who has ever been saved. There was a time, unless you were saved just at a real young age, you know, you just grew up in it, and you don't even hardly know when you received Christ. It just was as natural as breathing to you. But those of us, especially who got saved at an older age, I was 26, 
we see the contrast. We know the difference. There was a time when I didn't care about God. There was a time when I lived for myself, and I didn't give heed to the Word of God and, uh, or anything like that. So, again, the church is made up of many, many people who at one time didn't belong to God because they didn't care about God. But now they are God's people. Why? Because God graciously reached out and drew them to himself, and then he had mercy on them when they responded by receiving Christ as Lord and Savior. He drew them to himself by the power of the Holy Spirit, showing them their need of a Savior to wash away their guilt and to save them from hell. And those people responded by receiving Christ. Those are his people. He shows them mercy. 26. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Not just God's people. You're not just God's one of God's people if you're a Christian. You're not just one of God's people if you're someone who has repented of your sins and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You're not just one of God's people. You're not just saved. You're not just a Christian. You're one of God's children. You're in his family. This is bigger than being in his church. You're in his family. You're his child. You're his daughter. You're his son. When God saves a sinner who receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he takes that former rebel off the road to hell and places him not just on the road to heaven, but into his family. Even though he doesn't deserve any of it. Verse 27. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, like with the Gentiles. Only a small number of people with Hebrew blood in their veins will go to heaven. So you got Hebrew blood in your veins? You, you think that's a slam dunk? That means you're going to heaven? That's what John Haggerty evidently thinks. You got your own... Old, as long as you as long as you adhere to that old covenant, you're fine. We saw that last time. Now I'm not going to beat that dead horse. But I I've got to repeat it, just like just like with Gentiles, only a small number of people with Hebrew blood in their veins will go to heaven. God's people in every single age are always a small remnant of the whole population. So get used to the fact that if you live for Jesus and you follow him, you are not going to be a part of the majority. You are not going to be accepted by the crowd. You're not going to win any popularity contest. Verse 28. For he, listen to this. Listen to this. Well, let's read 27, 28 with it, okay? Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Verse 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And that's talking about judgment day. It will be swift judgment and swift eternal punishment without any opportunities for any appeals. It'll just be over. And that's what the Bible means when it says Christ is coming like a thief in the night. He's not coming like a thief in the night to the saved. He's coming like a thief in the night to the unsaved. Verse 29. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. If it wasn't for the mercy of God, no one would be saved. No one would be saved. If it wasn't for the mercy of God, no one would be saved. People ask, why does God save so few? You know, that's the wrong question. 
The correct question is, why does God bother to save anyone since even those he does save do not deserve it or even want it until he, of his own volition, draws them to himself by the power of the Holy Spirit. They not only don't deserve it, they don't even want it. They want to run from God. See, that's, that's why the salvation of any soul is a credit to God's mercy and grace. Verse 30, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles who followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. And the word Gentile simply means people who do not know God and people who do not care about God. People who do not know God, people who do not care about God. That's the Gentiles. But you know, there is hope for Gentiles who come to the realization by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, and they know that they are bad and that they have nothing to offer God in exchange for salvation. There's hope for those Gentiles. If they understand that they are hopelessly lost, condemned before Almighty God, guilty sinners, if they understand that, and if they understand that they have nothing to offer God in place of their salvation, and therefore as a result of that understanding, they repent and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, God will show them mercy. God will give them eternal life. Verse 31. But Israel who followed after the law of righteous the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness you know what i i keep backtracking i know i do but there is so much truth in these verses that i don't want them to be hidden from you by not seeing them in their context. So let me read 30 and 31 together. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, who follow not after righteousness, the Gentiles didn't care about God. They didn't have the word of God. They didn't care about God. Nothing. They just lived by their wits. They lived by, the, by their flesh. That's it. And what, what happened to the Gentiles? They have attained righteousness, even righteousness which is of faith. That's how they got it. But in contrast to that, Israel, verse 31, who followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. So you have the Gentiles who didn't care about God, had nothing to offer God, knew they had nothing to offer God, responded to the offer of salvation by faith apart from works through Jesus Christ. They responded to that. On the other hand, People like the Jews of our Lord's Day who thought they were smart enough and good enough to earn their salvation, they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. And you see, There are the same type of people in the world today. There are no account horrible sinners who know there are no account horrible sinners and, if, anybody, and if, they, if they ever forgot, there'd be plenty of people who would remind them. They know it and they know they don't deserve God. They don't know they deserve salvation. So they hear the message that they have to repent and they can't do anything to earn their salvation, but they have to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and trust in his work on the cross. That's their only hope. They, they jump on that a lot of times, see? But you tell a self-righteous, whether he's Jew or Gentile, a self-righteous religious person, a religious person who knows the liturgy. I mean, they can repeat the the responses by heart or they've prayed the sinner's prayer or they've been baptized or they've been going to church and singing in the choir I mean they're religious except 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 it's just a cultural thing with them see they you tell them that they've never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior if they haven't and they need to and they need to repent you know what you're gonna get you're gonna you're gonna get a a, a human being that it becomes as stiff and stubborn and hard as a ramrod. Wham! They'll be insulted. 
and they're not going to make it because they're self-righteous. They think they got what it takes because of all the stuff that they do or their spiritual pedigree handed down to them by their grandparents and their parents. Same exact thing as the Jews in our Lord's day. Same thing. 32. Why so? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. I hope you can grasp the meaning of this verse. Those who pursue, this is it. Those who pursue their salvation by works will not attain it. Salvation by works, salvation by self-effort, salvation by trying to be good enough is a hopeless pursuit which will end in failure, which will end in hell for every single person who pursues it by their good works. You are going to fail. And that's what God is saying, right? He's telling you ahead of time, you're going to fail. Give it up. Why so? Because they sought it, not what? They sought it. What's the it? Salvation. Because they sought it, salvation, not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, which was what? Verse 33. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross to pay for our sins, he is the stone in this verse. He is the stone. Some people hear the word of God concerning the cross, that Jesus died and paid for your sins, that he shed his blood on the cross as a sin offering for you to pay for your sins. Some people hear about that and, and they put their faith in Christ and as a result, they are saved. Others hear the exact same message and they say, I don't believe it. It just sounds way too simple. It's not sophisticated enough to me. It's not complicated enough for me. It's just way too simple. It's not intellectual enough. It's not sophisticated enough. Besides, I think I can measure up and make it up to heaven on my own merits. You don't stand a chance. Those people stumble over the message of the cross and they go to hell. And they go to hell. You know, there are only two groups of people in this world. Those who trust Christ and those who do not. That's it. God has the entire world divided into two sections. Those who trust Christ and his first work on the cross, those who do not. That's it. Every other race, every other social status, every other educational status are simply subpoints in those two general groups that God alone recognizes. Which group do you fall into? Unless you believe in me, Jesus said, you will die in your sins. I'm out of time. Continue studying the Word of God verse by verse at the Scripture verse by verse website found at the thebibleverseviverse.com. As I always say, I remind you again, click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. From Genesis through Revelation, that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And remember that I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. For 30 years, this has been a faith ministry. I've never taken a regular salary for teaching the Word of God. I have always depended on individual Christians who love the Word of God. And you can give in a secure method if God leads at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the donate button and give in a secure way according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you can write Scripture verse by verse, Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. That's Scripture verse by verse, Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, Zip code 53074. The web address, one more time, thebibleversebyverse.com. See ya.